thank you everybody for being here again. Uh, this is the second day of our conference, uh, Infiltration Challenging Supremacism. And I'm Tatiana Bazzichelli, the director of the Disruption Network Lab. And first of all, I would like to thank my collaborators, Kim Foss, Nada Bakker, and the Rail Verer, and also Jonas Franke for their wonderful work. And uh, I just would like to ask you please to say thanks to them and uh, clap a bit because they really deserve this. And so uh, here we are with our conference uh, infiltration. This is the second appointment of the misinformation ecosystem series that uh, started already in, with our event in May. And we define our conference as a journey inside right-wing extremism and supremacist ideology to provoke direct change. And first of all, I want to thank our funders, the Senat Verwaltung for Kultur und Europa, uh, translated in English, the Senate Department for Culture and in Europe in Berlin, the Riva and David Logan Foundation, the Checkpoint Charlie Foundation, and also the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. And so we have been working in partnership with the Kunstrand Kreuzberg Britannian and also Spectrum for a really long time now. And so this event is also in collaboration with the mobile counseling team against right-wing extremism, uh, in German, we would say the Mobil Beratung gegen Rechtsextremismus in Berlin, MBR. Also, the Alexandre from Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, and also Hostwriter. We have as media partner also TADS, ex Berliner, and Forterfield. And uh, I think that, uh, I mean, yesterday was really a wonderful event. We have been discussing about really important topics. There have been a lot of reflection and a lot of sharing, uh, and I'm happy also to say that uh, I'm proud to have here today these wonderful speakers that we invited. And uh, um, with the, this idea of infiltration challenging supremacism, uh, we want, uh, first of all, to ask some questions. So we want to understand uh, the aims, lifestyle, and methods of right-wing extremism, but uh, uh, in Germany, in Europe, but also internationally. And also, what is the drive for young and older generations to join extremist group? How can we analyze their dynamic from the inside? And what are the reasons of fascination of right-wing propaganda and supremacist outrage? Um, at the same time, I also think that for us, uh, the Disruption Lab has always been important to uh, try to reflect and define the strategies that we can imagine to provoke direct change. And I would say also this direct change could uh, come beyond opposition. So the idea is that, uh, of course, we don't want to erase the discourse of opposition, but we also want to try to reformulate it a bit in terms of culture, to try to first understand what are the aims and the reasons for the increasing right-wing extremism, and at the same time try to understand and imagine new strategies that we could individually and collectively apply to provoke a change. And so I'm uh, happy to start with the first part of the event uh, that I'm also going to moderate. But after I introduce our speakers, I will leave the stage to them because <laughs> I think they can do without me. Um, the title of this uh, uh, presentation is called Transgression Then and Now. Does the alt right reenact counterculture? And we have with us uh, Florian Kramer and Stuart Holm. Um, and I'm really happy to introduce them. Uh, Florian Kramer is the reader of the 21st century visual culture at the Wilhelm de Koenig Academy and the Pittsburgh Institute in Rotterdam. I hope my Dutch <laughs> pronunciation is not completely horrible, probably, yes. Uh, Anyway, uh, and also um, he has been working a lot with the discourse of meme war um, and uh, the alt-right, 
on the discourse, he was correcting me, yes. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, I would like to suggest you something related to that, because uh, there is an interesting YouTube lecture that he did, that is called Meme Wars, uh, Internet Culture and the Alt-Right. I would really suggest you to listen and watch this, because uh, I think we are not going really to touch in detail all this subject, but are pretty related also to what we are discussing here. And also there is a book that is coming out that is called Pattern Discrimination uh, in collaboration with Clement Saprich, Wendy Chan and Hito Steyer that is forthcoming for Minnesota University Press. Instead, Stuart Tom um, is an artist, filmmaker and writer, activist from London. Um, is the author of 15 published novels uh, and several works uh, of culture commentary. Uh, and uh, he has been also working a lot recently with the discourse of Bruce exploitation. And uh, he uh, just is publishing in these uh, current times a uh, book that is called Orienter the Dragon, uh, Gender Theory, Bruce exploitation, and the uh, sleazy joys of low bro cinema. And at the same time, he has also been working a lot uh, uh, with different galleries. Uh, his uh, recent uh, show uh, was uh, Dual Flying Kicks at the Five Year Gallery in London. But the reason also we invited them here together today is because they have actually a long history together, since they have been both part of the New East uh, uh, movement and the Luther Blissett project. Uh, and um, I was asking them before, when is exactly that you met, and this was 1989. And they have been also doing many lectures together in the past. I mean, uh, one that I really enjoy was about uh, uh, the discourse of net porn. And so I thought that was really interesting to have them again uh, here today with us uh, to explore this other discourse. Uh, and especially the connection and uh, the question mark if there is the connection between the counterculture uh, and the old right. And the idea will be that they will revisit uh, 70s and 90s counterculture currents that have been used uh, radical performance, viral communication and media hoaxes, and also uh, the influence that they might have on the info war for warfare of the contemporary extreme right. And uh, I'm personally also really interested in these uh, subjects and I've been also following since I was a young student the discourse of Luther Blissett project. So um, I'm also really pleased then to come back on stage with you and uh, share something about this. But now I leave the stage to you. Uh, thank you very much for being with us. Yes, hello. Um, we would like to start with this picture. Uh, and I'm not sure whether uh, many of you have seen this, but this was uh, a performance by Milo Yiannopoulos, who's maybe known as a former poster boy of uh, the so-called alt-right movement. And he made this performance together with other key figures of the alt-right in, uh, in a Brooklyn art gallery shortly before the Trump election. And actually, it was supposed to symbolize um, the victims of Islamic terrorism. So, so everyone there on, uh, 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 on the wall is someone who was supposedly killed by an Islamic terrorist and he uh, was uh, uh, bathing in that blood. Um, but there's a history to this, which we'll yes. look at Hermann Nitsch next, uh, who was a Viennese actionist. Uh, there's a lot of stories about these people. One story I couldn't discover whether it was true or not about Nietzsche coming to London, staying in a commune in Hackney, and the people there were um, concerned about the fact that he had a chicken to slaughter. So they freed the chicken and replaced it with a frozen chicken from a supermarket. But there are many stories about uh, the Viennese actionists. There were rumours that one who committed suicide had uh, killed himself as a piece of performance art. And out of that, there came a whole legend about a guy called John Fair, who was a non-existent artist who supposedly created a machine to hack off parts of his body until he was killed, uh, which got picked up industrial culture in the 1980s, which we'll move on to. 
Yes. So basically, there's, there's a history of, let's say, this type of performance, which began in the 1960s. And I still remember that 10 years ago in the Netherlands, Hermann Nietzsche was performing, and there was an extreme right-wing group which protested uh, the performance. So the question is, you know, has extreme right-wing culture changed when, uh, when it now does these uh, performances itself? We just show, show two, two other uh, artists, uh, John Duncan, um, is uh, an example of someone who maybe took this impulse from Vienna's uh, actionism and didn't put it so much into contemporary art, but more into subculture and underground culture. Uh, another one is someone who, let's say, founded the movement that we both were part of, uh, Ishvan Kantor, who, made, um, who sprayed his blood uh, as guerrilla actions in uh, art museums. And we should stress that Cantor in particular was uh, completely non-political, although I did have the experience of after he participated in an event in London, um, two guys who claimed to be Hungarian uh, journalists um, who acted very bizarrely turned up to speak to us um, at the venue. And uh, they claimed that they could, one of them couldn't speak English, although when I barked questions at him, he did, and they were very interested in just taking photographs of the walls of the building when we didn't... Um, so we said we didn't want our picture taken, but there was an American um, neoist there called Tentatively a Convenience who had an upside-down question mark shaped in his head, and he suggested that he'd stand on his head so they could take a picture of it, but when he couldn't stand on his head, he made them turn the camera upside down to take a picture. These appear to be secret agents, of course. Yeah. So, so basically, we have here a history of transgression, and the question is to which degree has, let's say, this iconography of transgression been taken over or hijacked by the so-called odd right When I use, uh, um, let's say, the picture credit of Milianopolis, I should also... Uh, uh, let's say, footnote it and say, um, Milo Yiannopoulos was someone who was highly produced. Uh, take his name with a grain of salt, because most of the articles and also the performances in his name were produced by the staff of Breitbart. You also see it by the fact that when he fell out of grace there, not, not much has come from him. So he's also a kind of, let's say, artificial poster boy. But we want to go into another contemporary uh, history. This is something that you might have encountered in the media, the so-called QAnon conspiracy theory, which very much comes out, yeah, the same uh, uh, subculture as the alt-right. It originated on the 4chan forum, and I know that in the next presentation we will hear more about 4chan. Uh, and it basically uh, says that um, uh, the the FBI investigations uh, against uh, Donald Trump because of uh, collusion with uh, the Russian government are orchestrated by Trump himself to um, uncover a gigantic pedof uh, pedophile conspiracy by the Democratic Party. So there are people actually believing this. But the point is, and actually I was involved in that, it, it, it hit me when I, I read about this, this was almost... That, that the script of Q, the, 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 the stories posted on 4chan, were basically plagiarized from a novel called Q, uh, written by Luther Blissett. Uh, and Luther Blissett being uh, then, uh, let's say, the moniker of uh, subcultural activists in Italy, and in that, that case also an, an, a, a collective of authors who wrote a, a historical novel on the history of Italian counterculture. And you saw that actually the, the people who, who, let's say, constructed the Q and non-conspiracy theory just lifted the script out of the Luther Blissett novel. So there's quite a lot of speculation about whether Q and non is left is satirizing the alt-right or is an alt-right originating meme um, plagiarized from a leftist source. And again, in terms of Luther Blissett, this comes very much uh, in a history of people using collective names, which could be traced back to the Berlin Dardaris, who had a Jesus Christ Society Limited. So if you paid a fee, you could become Jesus Christ. And then within uh, Mail Art, there was a project by Blitz Information in the 1970s where anyone could be Klaus Oldenburg. Uh, and then came the Neos with the name Monty Kansin, and then there was a the name Karen Elliott. So there's a whole history of these names of which Luther Blissett really improved upon the way in which these myths were spread and the idea of these collective identities. And we also saw something similar to that yesterday in one of the talks as well. And we, show, I mean, we should also add that, let's say, the people running the Luther Blissett project were friends of us, that we were involved yeah. as well. Um, I mean... Well, when uh, they, the, the founding myth was about a disappearing artist asking people to be 
to call themselves Luther Blissett, who disappeared into a war zone. So they hoaxed Italian TV into believing this, and the Italian TV came to London to interview me as uh, Harry Kipper's best friend, who was vaguely ba based on the Kipper brothers. So I was very much involved from the very beginning of this project, but it was originated in Bologna, and then they mm. contacted people they thought would be interested in participating. And a major uh, inspiration of that project was this book, um, and it was uh, published in the 1980s uh, by Research uh, Publishing in San Francisco, uh, run by V. Vale, who's uh, also a friend of both of us, uh, actually. And str uh, strangely was also the fourth member of Blue Sh Chair before they became a power trio, if you know the yeah. American band who had a big hit with Summertime Blues, yeah. heavy metal version. And you see here, maybe it's a small print, but there's a whole name of, let's say, prominent subcultural figures, mostly of the 1980s, um, who staged pranks as uh, ways of media manipulation or, um, uh, you could say, reality hacking. Um, we will bring this book back, back uh, later, and uh, you will see why we're bringing it up at all. This is here one of the kind of, you could say, proto-memes produced by the Luther Blissett project. So this was, let's say, the, the kind of... Uh, fictitious portrait of Luther Blissett, but then he was supposed to be this whole army of people who all ran under the name Luther Blissett. And of course, that was a precursor for uh, what became then the anonymous movement um, uh, in the 2000s. And it should also be said that the anonymous movement had exactly the same um, origins as the contemporary alt-right on the internet, namely the 4chan uh, board. Uh, originally, um, the name Anonymous just came from the people who were anonymous users of the 4chan board, and everyone was posting there, or aut automatically posted under the name Anonymous, and only later the anonymous movement also went into the street and uh, politicized. There are even some people who are, uh, have been involved, let's say, both in the anonymous movement and now in the alt-right. Um, the most prominent one is the hacker Weave, um, who is, you could say, one of the most sinister figures of, of the alt-right, uh, serving, among others, as uh, a system administrator um, uh, uh, for a number of alt-right websites. Um, so there is a certain, oh, I, sorry, I, I skipped this. Let's, let's uh, skip this, but um, uh, let's uh, uh, go uh, into this book. This is something, this is an anthology that you edited, that you published in the 1990s, I think in 1997. Yeah, it was, this is the cover of the reissue, but it was first yeah. published in 97. And this collected together a lot of the material of the groups I was involved with um, and people I was involved with. So there was some Italian Luther Blissett material. Uh, one of the key groups was the London Psychogeographical Association, which I included in here, who did all sorts of pranks. So when a British National Party councillor, who was the first fascist councillor elected for decades in the UK, uh, was elected in Limehouse in East London, they came up with a theory that there was a ley line uh, running through his council flat and encompassing all sorts of other important buildings and important sites in uh, the United Kingdom going from the south coast of England to the Scottish islands uh, called the Dragon Line. So they were claiming as a kind of joke that uh, the BMP had tapped into this and this also explained why uh, Ian Stewart had to die because the councillor had gone into hiding so the singer of Screwdriver was a sacrifice taken by the ley line, and this kind of pr this was taken up by Grant Morrison in his book *The Invisibles*. The idea of this particular ley line, which I think he renames the Dragon Line. So there was a whole series of other groups as well. There was the Autonomous Association of Autonomous Astronauts, who were trying to create an independent proletarian space program. There were the Aquaphalic Alliance, but it was a whole series of groups with left-wing views doing kind of prank culture to spread a leftist yeah. viewpoint. And uh, well. Full disclosure, I also have a piece in that book, and also another group, a German group, uh, that has a piece in that book is uh, the people from the Kommunikationsgerilla. Uh, they're also included. Well, if we just look at the, you know, at the title, the yeah, Psychic Warfare, Cultural Sabotage, and Semiotic Terrorism, it, you know, and then we fast forward into the present, um, then uh, we have info wars, uh, we have meme wars, um, and uh, it almost seems as if almost the same vocabulary is being taken up, but 
turned into right-wing extremism 20 years later. I mean, one of the things that I did, which uh, I don't think is in that book, was I wrote a lot of uh, joke material about the royal family, claiming they were involved in human sacrifice. I didn't ta expect people to take this seriously. Uh, but some journalists told me that when they invested people like David Icke, as far as they could tell, his belief that the uh, royals were reptiles um, and aliens ca uh, originated in my prank writing. So there does seem to be, people are suggesting connections between these things. Yeah. And I can see a connection here, although obviously I don't like it. Yeah, and the same with the Italian Luther Blizzard projects. One of their pranks was to suggest that there's a pedophile conspiracy uh, in the Catholic Church, uh, well, which actually was not so, <laughs> which was not <laughs> such, a, such a prank after all. But this whole kind of script has been then being taken up by the QAnon movement and the alt right as the pedophile uh, conspiracy uh, among the political left and the liberals. Uh, Pizzagate and QAnon being the two examples. Well, it goes further than that. I mean, we have Alex Jones and Infowars here, but uh, a line of defense, juridical defense that I use, it says, well, actually, I'm playing a character. I'm a performance artist. Yeah? Uh, and this is how, how he, he, he tries to escape uh, um, legitation. Yeah? So it's, it's, again, it's, it's as if this is a kind of reenactment of, of uh, 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 those 1990s uh, performances. Um, in some ways, I'd say he was more like a crisis actor, mm. uh, possibly fronting for the US government mm. um, to take his own conspiracies. But also, I think you saw, even going back into the industrial culture of the 80s, uh, a lot of the more rightist oriented, yeah. oriented people uh, very much wanted to associate themselves with art because they saw it as elitist, although obviously one can have a different take on art. Well touch upon that in more precision and with slides in a few minutes, but just to make a really quick juxtaposition I mean, to, to point out the kind of parallels between, let's say, the stuff that we have been involved in 20, 30 years ago, pranks, now we have trolling, shitposting, plagiarism, now we have memes, psychic warfare, now we have info war, uh, multiple names, so shared pseudonyms, um, now memes like Peep of the Frog, um, uh, discordianism, psychogeography, and now meme magic. We didn't go into this, but I think you will hear more about this in the, in the next talks. Also, I mean, if you just look at pseudonyms, uh, for example, in 70s counterculture in male art, people had names like Blaster, Elf, or Al Ackerman, or Anna Banana, and now these prominent alt right uh, uh, social media figures and YouTubers have names like Baked Alaska, Based Spartan, John o uh, Johnny Monoxide, he was one of the people um, on, on the billboard for the uh, Charlottesville Unite the, uh, 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 the Right uh, rally. So are these parallels um, um, coincidental or not? T to give you another example, well, actually, no, I should, you know, I should get my own NSK passport. This was, you could say, a, a subversive and conceptual art project by Leibach, uh, the NSK art group in Slovenia, to issue, to declare their own state and issue passports. Um, and nowadays, in Germany, we have the phenomenon of the Reichsbürger, the, the people who believe that the, the German Empire still persists and making their own passports. So, uh, again, is this, uh, is this comparable? Or, I'd, I'd yeah. also say in terms of meme magic, uh, people were calling themselves magician Marxists in um, the 1990s. So, again, there's a parallel in the yeah. terminology, although obviously it was leftist orientated. Yeah, and now we go maybe into more controversial uh, territory even. Um, uh, a very uh, popular um, subcultural theorist, um, still popular uh, cultural uh, theorist in the 1990s, was Peter Lambert Wilson, uh, writing under the name Hacking Bay, uh, with the concept of the temporary autonomous zone, which had you know, huge influence on, on various uh, counter and subcultures. But um, the question is, the, you know, on the right, we have a, oh, sorry, the, the date is incorrect. This is uh, 2018. I made a mistake. Um, uh, uh, Casa Pound is a, a, a neo-fascist squad uh, in Rome, which now also is own, its, its own political party and running for the elections. And you can ask yourself to which degree are the concepts of the uh, temporary autonomous zone that are being presented in a book like this now also practiced by the extreme right in a squad like Casa Pound. Although I should put in that uh, even in the 1990s, uh 
plenty of the people I was involved with were quite critical of uh, Hakim Bay and Peter Lamborn Wilson. On the one hand, because he was a member of the North American Man Boy Love Association. In other words, um, he advocated uh, making pedophilia legal. And on the other hand, because uh, a lot of people saw him as a rightist, he definitely came from a background involved with right wing conspiracy theory. Um, journals. He had also hung out with the Shah of Iran while people were being tortured in the basement of the palace and some of his ideas clearly related to the right and he was very influenced by people like René Guénon, uh, traditionalism. I wouldn't call Guénon a fascist in the way that I would Evola but you can definitely see um, a trajectory through that. Uh, we don't have time to go into all the issues now, but you can look it up if you want to. Look up Guinon, look up Peter Lamborn Wilson, Hakim Bay, and critiques of him as being essentially a right wing anarchist. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, if you talk about right wing um, uh, anarchism and take Casa Pound uh, as a point of departure, we can also go further back uh, into the let's say, cultural history uh, of the 20th century, Casa Pound, of course, takes its name from Ezra Pound, um, the avant-garde poet, um, who uh, in the early 20th century published um, this magazine and manifesto together with uh, Wynton Lewis uh, in the UK. And um, that was also part of fascist modernism. It was definitely fascist modernism, and it was uh, definitely related to futurism, which again is yeah. very associated with fascism, although some people have complex arguments about yeah. futurism's relation to fascism. But again, you can look those up. There's plenty yeah. of academic books. Yeah, Italian futurism. We just brought up uh, the uh, two books by Filippo T Tommaso Marinetti, who was its founder, also the writer of the original F Futurist Manifesto. Um, and um, if you read the, the, the um, uh, Futurist Manifesto, it's among others uh, on um, contempt of women uh, and uh, heroification uh, of uh, heroism and war. Uh, this year also means war, the only hygiene uh, of the world. So um, also the, the Italian Futurist Anna Marinetti became one of the main supporters of Mussolini and uh, became more or less official artist of the Mussolini uh, regime. Indeed, and again, we're drawing on theorists like Georges Sorel, um, who were also influential on Italian fascism, uh, who's generally seen as uh, an anarchist, yeah. but uh, people will be familiar with his book, Reflections on Violence. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, this was the invention of sound poetry, of noise music, literally. Uh, Arte de, uh, de Rue Mori was, was a futurist manifesto. Um, so a lot of that what, what is both avant-garde and counterculture in, in the 20th and 20th uh, century has its root there. And now we make a little uh, leap forward to an artist that I, actually you covered in your 1989 book, The Assault on Culture, she, uh, a male artist, Pauline Smith, and she had a project called The Adolf Hitler Fan Club. When I got involved with male art in London in the 1980s, uh, Pauline Smith had completely disappeared and was kind of this uh, figure that people talked about, but uh, you couldn't encounter directly. But her archive had ended up in, um, I think it had possibly gone via, via the V&A like Fluxu, although it might have gone directly into the Tate. But anyway, at the Tate, I could look at various um, archival pieces relating to her, and I was obviously particularly curious about the history of male art in London, although obviously it was a global phenomenon. This is where artists sent each other um, works through the post and it emerged out of one, the work of Ray Johnson and two Fluxus. Uh, when I looked at Pauline Smith's work, she very obviously had this discourse which you could see in other writers figures in uh, England about Hitler being uh, the historically most important figure of the 20th century. So while this might have started off as some kind of joke or prank, I think that she definitely ended up in a position of some sympathy to um, Nazi ideas. And it should also be said that she, her house was raided by the police and it was at the same, one of her collaborators or close correspondents was Genesis P. Orich, who is, I think, now quite known as a performance artist and also uh, one of the co-founders of industrial music and industrial culture. And we left out Genesis P. Orich and Thorin Gristle, but they're also used in a provocative, not serious way, fascist symbolism, SS-like uh, uh, rooms. The, the, lightning, the lightning flash they use came from the mm. British Union of Fascists, and obviously people will possibly be familiar with songs like Discipline. And we should also mention that uh, he came out of um, 
live art performance art in the UK, but was also a key early figure in um, English male art. Yeah. So basically our point is here that you could say by the 1970s, fascism also became, let's say, an element in transgressive practices, whether they are subcultural or labeled art. And um, one example that relates to Germany, then, well, of course, and also in the early let's say in the proto-period or in the period of the upcoming punk movement. Uh, this is how punk became famous uh, in Germany, through actually this cover story by Der Spiegel in 1978. Punk, culture from the slums, brutal and ugly. Uh, that was hugely inspiring uh, to a whole generation of uh, 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 people, musicians, uh, cultural, subcultural activists. Uh, in Germany. Well, you also see, if you enlarge the cover, you see there's Susie Sue from Susie and the Banshees uh, uh, wearing a swastika. They uh, were notorious for one of their early songs, which when they recorded it, Love in a Void, had the racial epithets removed and became too many figures for my liking. Um, uh, she doesn't appear to be Nazi, but played a huge role in goth subculture. I mean, what's interesting about this cover to me as well is that the biggest image is of Jane Wayne County, who was kind of part of the Warhol scene in New York, who's a famous uh, transsexual uh, rock and roll star, a very good rock and roll musician or singer. Um, and of course, Dave Vanian from The Damned, who also fed into goth subculture, but without any problematic content, which the Susie and the Banshees removed, uh, as they were obviously more interested in a career than uh, shock tactics that backfired. Yeah. So, and another example of, let's say, using fascist symbols as provocational transgression is actually here from the neighborhood, uh, 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 the um, early 1980s. Uh, this is a famous underground film from, um, from Berlin made by Tödliche Doris, and it's called The Life of Sid Vicious. And it's actually with a, um, with a young kid um, just uh, running around in the streets and, um, uh, and uh, wearing a... Uh, 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 swastika uh, being the young Sid Vicious. Um, um, yeah, uh, you can find this on YouTube. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the controls to, to uh, fast forward into it, but you get the idea. Of course, Tödliche Doris was everything but fascist. Uh, by the way, they're also part of the uh, uh, um, retrospective exhibition on um, West Berlin uh, um, arts and subculture at the other Britannian, at Künstlerhaus Britannian on, on uh, Cottbus Adam. I can highly recommend uh, seeing that. Um, but um, an, another coincidence is that one of their members, uh, Tabea Blumenschein, uh, in the late 1980s made even a funded a, a film, Saga Bata, which had as the main actor the singer of uh, Böse Onkels. Um, and even if you look, uh, Böse Onkels being perhaps the most n notorious right-wing band still in, in Germany today, uh, and even if you look at the beginnings of hardcore punk in Berlin, uh, you had the uh, KZ36 uh, um, here in, uh, uh, not the SO36, but the KZ, which was the hardcore punk uh, club, and out of that came a record label which put out the first German hard, uh, uh, um, hardcore punk sam samplers called uh, Soundtracks zum Untergang, Soundtracks uh, for, um, I don't know, um, the apocalypse, and um, uh, uh, on the first um, uh, edition of Soundtrack zum Untergang had the famous songs by uh, the left-wing, uh, extreme left-wing uh, punk band Slime, uh, like Polizei SRSS, among others. Uh, and the second uh, had the debut of uh, Böse Onkels. So at that time, it was still a mixed scene. Um, and you could uh, see how from the kind of transgression of punk culture, based, uh, uh, partly working with uh, symbols like the swastika, that some people took the transgression seriously. Uh, actually, the uh, German music journalist and, and uh, art theoretician Dietrich Dielsen wrote about this already in the 1990s. And now, yeah, we want to go further into, let's say, one strand of post-punk culture, the so-called industrial culture, we mentioned it briefly. And uh, this year is actually uh, from a zine by, made by Peter Sotos, who was also a member of the industrial band uh, White House, a quite, quite uh, famous band. And the zine is called Pure, and this is the first issue. And you see, actually, we can enlarge it. It starts uh, with a quote by Josef Goebbels, and then some 
uh, uh, let's say, an, an, an introduction that goes against liberalism and feminism. And you, if you read this, I mean, I presented it in a lecture here in Berlin before, I would say this could be a contemporary manifesto of the alt-right. It uses almost the same kind of rhetoric of, you know, the, the extreme right of fascism being the new underground. And the other thing about Peter Sotos, he was notorious for writing pedophile stories. Um, I had the misfortune to be invited to an academic conference in the English Midlands where he'd also been invited, which I didn't realize until I got there. Um, so we had the experience of the press trying to get into the venue uh, while he was locked in, looking very kind of frightened and uh, not understanding why the uh, British tabloid press would be interested in uh, a pedophile story. I mean, he just seemed very stupid and uninteresting to meet. Uh, but uh, obviously, with right, White House, it was very much about being extreme and their whole image was to be more extreme than Throbbing Gristle. So they did songs like Right to Kill, never realizing that extremism is relational and not rational. So Right to Kill is extreme in terms of a liberal discourse. If you have perhaps come from a more leftist position, you wouldn't necessarily uh, go for the idea of rights because you might see it as bourgeois. But anyway, I don't think they ever had a grasp of these issues. And uh, let's say we're presenting you three artists from the industrial culture movement. The second one is, I think, more prominent, uh, and that's Boyd Rice, um, quite a legendary figure. Uh, and he's someone, let's say, who, who played, uh, uh, first played with, with uh, fascist iconography and uh, symbols, and it was not quite clear is he serious or not. But then later it became quite clear that he was serious about this, uh, bonding with uh, top figures of the American uh, neo-Nazi movement. Yeah, he famously posed for photographs with the head of the American Front, uh, which appeared to be influenced by the uh, British National Front. And also he appeared on uh, racist cable TV, uh, and if you read the uh, biography of his one-time lover, Lisa Carver, who he uh, notoriously beat up, she writes about that, but uh. just writes about him living in squalor with not, you know, Nazi swastika flags hanging on the wall. This is from his blog. I mean, uh, Lisa Carver, who is also known as Lisa Suckdog. Yes, yeah, that's And by correct. the way, also had some relations to the movement that we were involved in uh, neoism because she worked with Tentatively a Convenience. So there again, yes. we're... Uh, strange crossovers. Yeah, strange crossovers. And uh, curiously, when I was here at the first day of the conference, um, I uh, took some moment to check my email and I'm subscribed to the uh, newsletter of Freeze and this was just yesterday in Freeze um, that a New York gallery canceled an exhibition because uh, Boyd Rice was in it and they realized who he was. So this is really fresh off the press. Uh, um, I, I wouldn't have uh, uh, expected that uh, to coincide with this conference. And if you want to um, read some good analysis of Boyd Rice, there was a blog that isn't current anymore, but uh, uh, from a few years ago, who called Who Makes the Nazis, which covered him very thoroughly. I was interested to see that when I checked his Wikipedia entry, uh, which appears to have been edited by his fans to excuse his Nazism, uh, that they referenced a piece I wrote, which was actually about another musician he's involved with, Tony Wakeford, and he was mentioned in passing, rather than providing a reference to the more substantial critique of him, which you can find on Who Makes the Nazis. Yeah. So early in our presentation, we mentioned this book by a research publishing called Pranks, which was, let's say, maybe something like a script for many of these uh, 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 yeah, uh, subversive movements in the 1990s. Um, and if you actually look at the list of artists who are being covered in it, one of them is also Boyd Rice. Yeah? Um, so uh, even, let's say, in the kind of pretext to this, you couldn't say that the politics of the protagonists that were featured in a book like that was very clear-cut. They were both uh, uh, members, you could say, of the extreme left and the extreme right involved uh, in this. And so in a way, you could say it's, it's a repetition of what already happened, for example, in avant-garde art of the early 20th century, where you have the extreme right of the futurists, but also the extreme left of the Berlin Dadaists. Uh, I'd also say that uh, this very much has an American bias and that you see less um, effort to separate the strands than you would in Europe where there was a lot more people making a leftist critique of right-wing currents in the counterculture, I'd say, mm -hmm. than in uh, the USA. 
And around the same time, in the early 1990s, there was a zine called Answer Me, which, which was basically about transgression, about serial killers, about uh, transgressive sex, etc. It was uh, uh, edited, published by a writer called Jim Goat, who's uh, based in Portland, Oregon, uh, one of the countercultural cities uh, in the US. And, well, two of the writers that published in Answer Me were Boyd Rice and Peter Sotos, so we're getting full circle. And also, I should say that when I went and did a reading tour of the West Coast, uh, in 1995, the year after this was published, uh, organised by one of my publishers, AK Press, who are anarchists, they thought it was a good idea to take me to go and meet uh, Jim and Debbie Goad when we were in Portland. Um, so I got taken to their house, which consisted of um, them putting on videos of a guy whose head was cut off, uh, pissing on women, uh, which they said it was Chuck Berry, but it could have been anyone from what I could see. It wasn't a very interesting evening for me, um, but maybe it was good for facilitating uh, sales for this uh, magazine. Yeah. And so Peter Goat, who was like a cult underground writer of also the alternative scene in, in Portland, then later in 1997 published this book uh, called The Redneck Manifesto. and. Um, just to fast forward, um, uh, this book and Jim Goat is now a cult figure of the art, right? Um, there's an article uh, on this. I don't remember whether it was from Vox or Vice. I don't remember, but you can, if you Google it, you will find it. Um, well, there is one really prominent art, right, group uh, in the U.S., which are called the Proud Boys, uh, and the Proud Boys were. Um, founded by the co-founder of uh, Vice magazine, Gavin McInnes, who is now one of the figures, prominent figures, also prominent social media uh, figures uh, of the alt right and has founded the Proud Boys as basically, yeah, uh, you could say a fraternity, a militant fraternity. Um, uh, they were also uh, involved in organizing Charlottesville, although um, um, uh, McInnes withdraw, withdrew his support uh, shortly uh, uh, before the rally. Um, and if you want to become a member of the Proud Boys, you have to read the Red, uh, Redneck Manifesto of Jim Goat. That is, uh, is one of the, the pre prerequisites uh, for being accepted uh, uh, into the organization. And we should also point out that, uh, like Boyd Rice, Jim Goat is someone else. Uh, who beat his uh, wife and girlfriends and was in fact jailed for it. Mm. This is the kind of people who are attracted to men's rights. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, the, the whole men's right movement of the so-called manosphere is another can of worms that we're not tapping into, but it's very much related to what we are covering here. Well, Gavin McInnes also was part of the gallery exhibition with which this presentation started. So you saw my in the in the bloody bathtub. Uh, these were the two works by Gavin McInnes, which he contributed uh, uh, to the exhibition. So again, it's, it's one network. We should also say that one of the the uh, frequent um, guests in Gavin McInnes' YouTube uh, talk, uh, talk show is Jordan Peterson. Um, there's, there's, uh, the two are very closely in, in interconnected. And, and again, we're getting into this discourse of men's right and masculinity that's very closely uh, related to the art right. Yeah, if you want 12 rules to ruin your life. <laughs> Okay, but now we're getting actually into uh, things that you published and how they relate to present right-wing culture. Yeah, um, obviously this was from the mid-1980s and I was mixing situationist um, ideas with po the postmodernism that was fashionable at the time and using a kind of advertising imagery. And um, that use of advertising imagery in a strand of the alt-right, if we move on to the next picture, uh, in the UK, you have the uh, Young Britons Foundation, which is um, very much modelled on the Young Americans Foundation. I don't know if people are familiar with this, don't have time to go into it. Uh, this was right-wing neoliberal members of the Tory party. They styled themselves the Tory Madrasa. They wanted to radicalise young conservatives, young members of the Conservative Party, so they would take... Um, right-wing Tory slogans and uh, kind of attach them to uh, sexualized pornographic imagery. What's particularly interesting is that they attempted to take over the City of London Council, which failed, although one of the members 
uh, who did, did succeed. Uh, the, the key members are Mark Clark, Andre Walker, Donald Blaney, and Matthew Richardson, who is a became a top UKIP official and suggested UKIP use big data in the election before the Brexit referendum and then was the connection to Vote Leave and Cambridge Analytica. And he is also uh, a councillor on the City of London Council, so he's a very interesting and underplayed figure. Uh, Cambridge Analytica, the, the uh, data mining company that worked uh, for Steve Bannon and is also part of, let's say, the Breitbart empire, is owned by the, by the same owners and financed by uh, Robert Mercer, who is one of the main financiers, uh, you could say, of the more moderate part of the alt-right in, in America. And of, uh, Richardson was also the connection uh, between uh, UKIP and Farage and uh, Bannon. He was very, this whole group were very early on, early on in connecting into kind of the American uh, alt-right neoliberal circles. This is again something that I, I should explain. This is something you published in your zine Smile, and Smile back then was also a multiple name like, like uh, Luther Blissett, so everyone could adopt that name and, and make Smile magazines. Uh, this is what I did, actually, and this is how we got in touch originally. There were actually hmm. um, probably several hundred different people hmm. issuing magazines called Smile, although a lot of them only issued one issue, but I kept going with it, and I was very interested in trying to undermine advertising type imagery at the time, so this was a play on a slogan, Naughty But Nice, which Salman Rushdie famously wrote as an advertising copy, um, but I took a very cheap product, and again, if we go on to the next slide, we'll just see how um, that kind of... Uh, neoliberal far-right use of sexist imagery, um, obviously manosphere in mm -hmm. interest as well. I mean, these, uh, the two pieces I've taken from Young Britain's Foundation are from 2010, so it's quite early on, and they were very early on in making the American connections as well, which is why I think they're interesting and worth looking at. So if you give, give a kind of preliminar preliminary conclusion or summary, we could say, well, all uh, the claims, uh, I don't know, um, the extreme right has hijacked counterculture, or even, which I just read uh, in, a, in a UK conference announcement, uh, counterculture is now on the right and no longer on the left. I think they're grossly, we both think, are grossly simpl simplifying and even wrong, uh, because they ignore this whole history of gray zones uh, uh, and presence of both the extreme right and the extreme left both in, in art avant-garde and, and various countercultures. Um, I would like to, to make now a huge historical step back into the 19th century, um, actually into the work of a German illustrator um, who was you know, the um, artist of the so-called life reform movement, um, so, um, or Lebensreform uh, Bewegung. Uh, in, in uh, German, his, his name was, well, he was working under the name Fidos, his, his bourgeois name was Hugo Höppener. And um, those were the kind of images uh, that he created at, at the turn of the 19th uh, and 20th century. And I think you, you recognize this kind of style. It's something that you would also associate with hippie culture. Uh, I think also, until recently, if you went, for example, into an organic food store, you would find packaging with very similar artwork. Um, and um, uh, also the combination of naturism, nudism, um, uh, he healthy living, exercise, vegetarianism, also free sex, free love, all that was present, uh, of course, in the life reform movement and probably is you know, masterfully uh, uh, depicted uh, also in these, these pictures. You can just do a Google image uh, search on uh, Fidus and you will, uh, will find many more of those pictures. You will also see that they inspired a lot of uh, uh, more contemporary pictures. But Fidus was also one of the first German fascists, actually. Um, so here, um, this is, is a work, uh, it's called Sexual Religion, it's on sexual uh, moral, sexu uh, sexual mystic, and se sexual magic. It, this was drawn by him, and you also see the swastika there, this is from 1897. Um, you of course know this uh, symbol as another fascist symbol, this is from 1914. Uh, uh, and this is called, um, this was uh, the publication um, uh, the proceedings of uh, a group that called itself the Germanic uh, Community of Belief. Um, 
from 1920, where you also have the swastika as a, as a central symbol. This is also drawn by him. Uh, and he became a member of the NSDAP in the 1930s. And if you ever wondered why Hitler was a vegetarian, it's well because National Socialism came also out of the life reform movement. Uh, and uh, uh, if you even look at, at uh, films uh, that were made in the Third Reich, for example, some of the films by uh, Veit Hanan, you will see a lot of nudity in them that was impossible, for example, in post-war West German uh, cinema. It had to do with these roots. So you could say at the roots of counterculture and alternative uh, culture uh, in the West uh, was a movement that, had, that went both into the uh, political extreme right and into the political left. And if you want to take something else that would maybe be associated with something quite fluffy nowadays, you can go back to uh, the disputed uh, port city of Fiume immediately after the First World War where um, Gabriel D'Annunzio took control and kind of created a proto-fascist regime which was in many ways the blueprint for Mussolini. Uh, one of the artistic groups operative there on the fascist side was called Yoga, which was very much a splinter from futurism. But again, we don't have time to go into it, but you can look mm. it up online. Okay, we are, we are practically at the end uh, of... Yeah, yeah, uh, we, we, uh, we are getting towards the end of our, our uh, uh, presentation. Uh, um, the last uh, subject matter that we want to uh, cover is, um, let's say, the interface or the gray zones between anarchism and the extreme right. And this is a quite a contemporary phenomenon if you're particularly talking about the American alt-right. I think it is also something that is much more significant uh, uh, for the situation in America than it is for Europe. Um, so one of the important factions or parts of the so-called alt-right, uh, or at least an affiliated part of it, is the so-called neo-reactionary movement, uh, which mostly consists of two theoreticians. Um, uh, the one is Curtis Yavin, who is also known under his pen name, Mencius Moldbach, uh, and uh, the, the other one is the former uh, media theoretician, Nick Land. Uh, and, um, uh, this here is taken from Rational Wiki, so a website, let's say, that tries a kind of rationalist debunking of conspiracy uh, uh, theorists. And uh, they characterize, I think, correctly um, the neo reaction movement, which has a fascist, I would say, uh, uh, advocacy for, um, uh, for um, uh, basically a kind of neo monarchy uh, and a rule of the stronger. Um, uh, as um, something that grew out of libertarianism. And we should also say one particular form of uh, libertarians mentioned here as well, anarcho-capitalism. Um, uh, anarcho-capitalism has this flag. Um, um, anarcho-capitalism is a more American strand of anarchism that you could say is the, the, the extremist form of neoliberalism. Um, um, it uh, tries to where you could say neoliberalism uh, mostly wants to, to abolish uh, the state uh, and replace it through, through uh, corporations and the free market anarcho-capitalism wants to radically replace the state. Uh, uh, I, I would have a slightly different emphasis from yes? okay. Florian. I would say that it's more important in Anglo-American circles rather than simply America, although yeah. the UK is part of Europe, whether people like it or not. Um, mm. And in the UK, you saw a guy called Chris Tame, who had an organization called the Libertarian Alliance, and that very much had an impact on right-wing Tory students, in yeah. particular going back right to the 1980s. And so I think that was something that was being traced through what I was saying. In terms of Nick Land, I just would point out that I came across him uh, through Sadie Plant, who I'd met through a libertarian left communist group called Here and Now based in Leeds in the north of England and she was his girlfriend and worked with him at Warwick and is also her first book was on the Situationist International so again there were these uh, people linking up and then moving away I've never had any problem with um, Sadie's politics she always seemed to like rather sad boyfriends and the thing that uh, I noticed about Nick Land when I saw him talk a few times was that he made all these weird hand gestures all the time Okay, here, here we have a meme uh, made by the ANCAP uh, movement, uh, which sees 
uh, other forms of, of anarchism as a devolution from uh, anarcho-capitalism and anarcho-capitalism, let's say, as the original form of, of anarchy. Um, there is a strong connection between um, uh, anarcho-capitalism or ANCAP culture and so-called cyber-libertarianism. So um, cyber li libertarianism, you could say a form of, of anarchism or libertarianism that is closely linked to hacker cultures, um, um, where also ideas like the temporary autonomous zones um, were uh, very popular. Um, uh, one of the manifestations of cyber libertarianism clearly is Bitcoin, huh? to, to, to have um, uh, a currency that is not in state control. Um, um, and uh, uh, is, is based on a radical free market uh, uh, principle. But cyber libertarianism also is an ideology that is uh, quite prominent in Silicon Valley since the 1990s. It is also linked to the idea of transhumanism. Um, so let's say a self um, improvement or you could say a, um, improvement engineering of mankind, uh, overcoming mortality. Uh, also linked uh, to the ideas of, of uh, the singularity, so of artificial intelligence superseding uh, uh, other forms, including human uh, uh, intelligence. If you look at the, the, the people who are advocating them, uh, uh, then you see that many, if not most of them, have strong cyber libertarian uh, 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 um, um, uh, uh, roots or links. Um, and a prominent figure here um, in the, let's say, corporate part um, of Silicon Valley is uh, Peter Thiel, um, uh, one of the main investors in Silicon Valley, um, co-founder of uh, PayPal, um, early uh, uh, investor of uh, Facebook, um, and uh, who already in, in uh, several years ago um, um, uh, developed the ideas, you could say, of autonomous zones, namely sea setting studying uh, cities, cities built in, in open waters that would uh, not be under government control. Um, and he famously uh, wrote an article uh, in 2009, um, uh, The Education of a Libertarian, where you could say this Marx is kind of flipping f or is, is one of the markers of uh, how libertarianism flipped into a neo-reactionary uh, uh, ideology, uh, where he said, most importantly, I no longer believe that freedom and democracy are compatible. Um, it is rumored, but I should say uh, uh, that there is no hard proof that he is uh, the person who finances uh, uh, Curtis Yavin, uh, uh, Menzies Mo, uh, uh, Goldbach, but, but I think there is no, no uh, uh, s uh, strong uh, proof for, for this yet, but at least there, there is a strong connection uh, and uh, alliance between him uh, and uh, cyber libertarianism. So we can definitely say, again, um, just as with the subcultures, uh, libertarianism, anarchism, including cyber libertarianism, didn't go to the extreme right as a whole, uh, you would also find left-wing uh, uh, factions or left-wing manifestations of, of cyber libertarianism or transhumanism, uh, but a, a sizable and considerable part has gone that way. We also see it, let's say, if you look, for example, at the German situation and um, uh, an organization like, for example, the Chaos Computer Club, uh, which also has very strong, strong cyber libertarian influences, is generally on the left, but also has a lot of gray zones between um, um, uh, left wing and extreme right uh, 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 ideology. And uh, for those of you who are reading German, I, I recommend reading the blog by Felix uh, von Leitner. Um, that's really a manifestation of how I would say parts of alt-right discourse and part of extreme left uh, discourse really go uh, mix each other in the same person. I'd also stress that I wouldn't only see anarcho-capitalism mm -hmm. as the only form of right-wing anarchism. I certainly um, have written about and strongly see uh, parts of the anarcho-primitivist move, um, anarcho movement as uh, right-wing and far-right, particularly when you had groups like Green Anarchists in the UK talking about blowing up dole offices to uh, end, end people's welfare dependency. Um, and you can see that in some of the support for the Unabomber and things like that. Um, the thing, what was interesting was the things in the middle of that meme would appear to be more on the left and on either end you had the anarcho-capitalists and the anarcho-primitivists. Yeah. Uh, 
we want to wrap it up with this. Um, welcome, Peter Pinguit Society. This is a little hint for those of you who have read uh, Thomas Pynchon's novel, The Crying of Lot 49, which came out in 1966 and is a kind of fictionalized um, uh, history of uh, the Californian counterculture of that time. And one of the players, one of the, the parts of that, that uh, even conspirational counterculture is um, a person um, uh, 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 called Mike Fallopian, um, who represents the Peter Pinguit Society, and that's actually a neo-fascist movement. So even back in that time, the, the, let's say the presence of fascism and neo-fascism within countercultures was acknowledged or was seen. That's, that's, that's all we it, have to yeah. say. Thanks. So thank you very much for this uh, really dense uh, presentation. I always really enjoy when you present because that makes me feel that I want to go to explore all these possible links that you are mentioning. And so since I also know, uh, I mean, I was also part of this history in, in a certain way, um, I feel also the responsibility to ask you to specify a bit better what are the intense that you have for this presentation because uh, um, uh, you know when you say for example the question was is the alt-right invalidating the culture trans transgression and the counter culture um, I'm afraid that if we perceive uh, what you just said as a straight line uh, that you know goes from counter culture to the alt-right then in the sense uh, you are invalidating the culture of transgression. And uh, since I know that is probably not your intention, um, I want to ask you uh, how you would actually respond to your own question, uh, because I think that uh, in many of the projects that you were mentioning, uh, you also said uh, it was really important to perceive them as uh, uh, often multiple projects with, uh, you know, grade zone inside. Um, for example, I just want to uh, tell you, I mean, of course, I'm not going to, you know, put on a pedestal Ezra Brown, uh, but I also wanted to say that uh, I was reading that the daughter of Ezra Pound was uh, completely outraged by the fact that they used the name of the father for Casa Pound. And she was actually saying that uh, she doesn't agree that the name of the father is used for this uh, center in Rome, because uh, besides also doing uh, their so-called cultural act activity, they are also really famous uh, for being uh, violent uh, right extremists that are going beating up uh, uh, immigrants and so she say I don't want absolutely that the name of my father is connected to these people so my question is is actually their appropriation are they conscious of what they are doing uh, because I don't think that this is a straight line otherwise we risk to invalidate cultural transgression because I still want to hope that, you know, especially us that are working with culture and transgression and disruption, feel free to uh, use this kind of uh, imaginary that inspired us so much in the 90s to do certain kind of interventions. And I'm afraid that then there is the risk that we will somehow tag as right-wing extremists if, you know, we are using this vocabulary. You want to uh, yeah, I mean... In terms of Ezra Pound, I, he was uh, jailed for being a uh, propagandist for Mussolini after the war, and you can see the photographs of him giving the Nazi salute or the fascist salute when he returns to Italy after, but sorry, he wasn't jailed, he was put in a, a lunatic asylum, uh, after he was freed. Um, while I have sympathy for his relatives who don't share his views, I don't find it surprising that Casa Pound used his name. I think what I would very much argue for is to fight against um, those who are using pranks and transgressive culture for right-wing ends, and also to emphasize that when you see a prank uh, 
by Luther Blissett or by whoever else. It's like it should be like an iceberg. The the funny thing that you laugh at first of all is the ten percent above the water, and then ninety percent, which is, should be carrying a um, message or a leftist message, should be underneath the water. And I think often with the uh, right wing pranks, there's less to the prank. And you especially see that in the first picture of uh, Mylianopolis. I mean, if I teach at an art school, if he were my student, um, I, you know, I wouldn't necessarily take, take issue with his politics uh, because that's not my job as a teacher. But I would say, you know, this is a really, really bad enactment, a really shallow reenactment of, of actionist art. And it doesn't go farther than making that uh, statement. So it's even, even bad as what it, it uh, tries to be. So in answer to your question, I would say, um, uh, transgression is a tool. Yeah? Transgression is like a hammer. It's like a hammer with which I, I, I smash a glass. There is no intrinsic value to, to uh, transgression. It can go either way. You can use it for the one thing or for the other. Um, so that also means very often that you see that, that um, uh, you, in such cultural currents, you have people who are doing transgression for the sake of uh, transgression. And I think that particularly the industrial culture uh, uh, movement was a really good example for that, especially the people we, we covered, like Peter Sotos. Um, and then those, those people can, for example, end up on the extreme right just because they want to be the most transgressive person in the room. Yeah? Um, but it's also really important, I think, to fight this narrative that is now being uh, produced by the extreme right, by the alt-right, to say, well, Transgression nowadays is a right-wing thing in an, uh, in an, in an e uh, era of political correctness. If you're uh, today transgressive, you, you have to be right uh, but, uh, because you can't be transgressive on the left. That's, that's bullshit. And also, let's say the fights on political correctness, they have been fought, uh, always been fought. Um, I mean, uh, they've been fought here in this district already in the 1980s, so it's, it's, not a new, it's, it's not a new story, and I think it's really important also to create this historical awareness in order not to buy easily into these revisionist narratives. But, and do you think that these people doing this uh, revisionist narrative are actually having the same uh, background uh, knowledge that you have? Because I'm also wondering if they would really understand what you are saying. Because uh, for sure, if we speak uh, uh, the, about the actionism, this is almost a mainstream uh, art uh, um, part of history. But uh, I mean, when we speak about Luther Blissett, for example, I mean, I really wonder if this would be the connection that they do. So that is why I'm asking you this, because uh, when we were imagining all these kind of practices and we were really happy to call them transgressive, we were also imagining to build up something that was, for example, in Italy, political. So there was not just the idea of doing transgression per se, at least in the Italian history. Uh, I would say then if we speak about punk history, it's different because many of them were much more close to anarchism. But for example, Luther Blissett, uh, I mean, I don't want to define Luther Blissett because we know it should not be defined, but part of this history in Italy was imagining this multiple identity also to create uh, um, a strong criticism of media, uh, of the press, uh, and also create uh, this kind of info war, but for a constructive perspective. And so, I mean, I feel uh, disturbed by the fact that now the alternative right is even called alternative. This is really disturbing me because I feel that uh, first alternative to what? Because I think they are actually extreme right. So alternative right is a bit of a propaganda idea. And also they are uh, uh, even appropriated the discourse of being alternative. That was something really political. In I, yeah. may, may I react to that? I would say, you know, the, what we showed, someone like Fidos Hugo, uh, Hugo Hepner was alternative right in the 19th century. He was, he was absolutely alternative right. Ezra Pound uh, was alternative right. Even Boyd Rice, uh, as stupid as he might be, was alternative right. I almost feel like I need to teach the alt right where they're actually coming from because they don't really seem to know it. Uh, and uh, so in, in that sense, I would say a term like alternative, again, is a tool. 
Alternative just means you're different. You can be different in, in various ways. You can, can differ from the mainstream by being extreme right or extreme left by itself. Being alternative is no value. Uh, I also think, uh, you know, fascism and Nazism uh, has a very bad reputation with a lot of people, obviously, if you live in London like I do in the UK, the British identity is partly founded on being anti-Nazi and anti-fascist. Um, so people just want to come up with new names uh, to cover up what their real beliefs are and where they're really coming from. And again, you can go back to the 1960s and look at the French New Right, who were basically trying to repackage fascism uh, in a way that was more palatable. And now you could say, if you want the Swedish Democrats are doing the same thing, let's hope they do badly tomorrow. Yeah, and we should say that the French uh, New Right or Nouvelle Droite um, is uh, what has been taken up in Germany uh, most prominently by Götz Kubitschek and is basically now the, uh, the, the main uh, uh, ideology of movements like uh, Pegida and uh, the AfD. But also wanted to ask you something individually, uh, knowing what uh, you are doing, because uh, you, Stuart, were always working uh, with discourse related to transgression, and also we know that the background of punk has been often um, also directed to not accepting the discourse of being politically correct. Uh, so how do you position yourself, since now uh, much of the left uh, is embracing the discourse of being politically correct also as a, a kind of opposition to the right appropriating the discourse of transgression. But then what is our role here for people that uh, were working with transgression and disruption in a way that was uh, a form of art? And also I would ask you, uh, I mean, since you also teach with uh, with students uh, and you speak with students uh, um, how would you then frame the past that you are being also part of like neoism uh, uh, would you feel to inspire them to do the same uh, because uh, no but uh, this is important because uh, like 10 years ago we would have discussed about neoism also as a really important movement that inspired big part of networking, uh, uh, net art, a uh, uh, lot of other practices, uh, the whole discourse of even activism online and so on. And uh, if you go back to this straight line and these people are appropriating, I wonder if young people would feel comfortable to express uh, the idea of, uh, um, you know, political criticism in the way we were doing. So what is uh, actually... A, kind of hope that we could give to <laughs> these people to still be able to be transgressive because I think it's an important thing because transgression is also creation of intervention in society so I don't want to be uh, you know, I don't want to accept that transgression is appropriated and so what do we offer I think you have to pick your way through things carefully and I would also um be wary of the term political correctness because I think it was a concept invented by the right to enchain the left. I don't uh, think uh, uh, my views are politically correct or the views of those who are labelled politically correct are politically correct. They're just sensible. There's a huge difference. You don't need that term. I don't find it a useful term at all. And you just have to work through um, different debates. I mean, at the moment, one of the very contentious things that a lot of people are talking about is uh, trans rights and there's issues in London to do with uh, gender neutral toilets and with uh, bathing ponds whether um, trans women can um, use these facilities. Now some people argue they're, they're um, men and some people argue they're women. I don't particularly want to take a position in terms of uh, that argument with women. I prefer to leave it to, for women to sort out for themselves, which gives me a nice way of stepping back from it. But I fully support trans men being able to use male spaces. And you're even seeing um, one thing I didn't mention in relation to the, the um, neoliberal stuff I brought up was actually it also connects in with Freemasonry in a big way. And one doesn't have to understand Freemasonry in terms of a right-wing discourse about conspiracy theory because when um, 
dealing with Freemasonry in relation to, say, the City of London and London councils. You see it associated with right-wing councillors with the Conservative Party. It creates a conservative atmosphere, uh, but at the same time, it's uh, what's more important is operative and not speculative Freemasonry. It's speculative Freemasonry that the right talks about in conspiracy theories. So you literally have uh, people who are planning consultants who also get in charge of planning permission, uh, planning committees on councils and then give permissions uh, for people they work with to build buildings which are going to be very detrimental to the people who live right by them. Um, so there's just a different way of picking through these discourses and understanding that things can be important. And again, you're seeing um, parts of, uh, you know, kind of neoliberals in uh, London picking up on trans right and gay right discourse and trying to use that as a way of furthering their agenda. And you just have to counter it with a different uh, uh, gay rights and trans rights um, discourse. Okay. I will try to give a multi-layered uh, answer to your question. Um, well, first of all, uh, uh, I would say um, in, in any kind of cultural phenomenon that, that I encounter, and no matter whether um, it is, uh, you know, whether it, 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 it is in politics, it's in philosophy, um, in popular culture, in art, or whatever these categories mean or still mean, um, First, I would be curious, yeah? and uh, to go back to Ezra Pound, Ezra Pound is not someone uh, that I would wanted, uh, uh, want to have removed from book stacks or from exhibitions. Yeah? So first of all, I want to see, is there any interesting idea in it? And there has been a lot of interesting thinking, maybe, Stuart, you don't agree with me, um, uh, on the political right, even on the extreme political right, if you, for example, think of a philosopher like Heidegger in the 20th century. Um, um, so, for example, those of you who use deconstruction as a concept, uh, that is actually a concept uh, coined by, by Heidegger. Um, and uh, what I currently see with the so-called odd right is they're trying to exactly claim that. They're, they're using the concept of um, cultural hegemony, which comes from Gramsci, actually from uh, Italian uh, leftism, and trying to turn it around. Uh, that's also the whole politics of the French uh, Nouvelle Droite, which has been taken into the present. But they're not able to do it because the people they have are not interesting enough. Um, they, ha they don't have any new, new ideas. Um, it's, it, it, is, it is very poor. Um, uh, if, if you go further than the surface level, there is, they, they don't have an Ezra Pound, they don't have a Marinetti, they don't have an Heidegger, no. Uh, and that's the kind of promise, but this kind of house of cards really uh, quickly collapses when you look at it. Um, for that reason, you know, maybe you could, you could call me then a kind of old-fashioned aestheticist. I would say that also in, 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 in movements like Neoism or the Luther Blissett projects, uh, there was conscious ambiguity. And conscious space uh, transgression also means that you leave space for things uh, that you do not agree with, yeah? also politically do not agree with. I remember uh, when I was involved in the Luther Blissett project, I once got an, an anonymous letter to my house. Uh, back then I was still living into Berlin. Uh, and uh, it just was uh, a piece of paper that said, Europe, uh, 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 love it or leave it, foreigners out, Luther Blissett. I don't even know whether this was made by someone who was extreme right and taking over the Luther Blissett identity or whether it was someone from the left wing Luther Blissett who was just trying to play with uh, how far can such a multiple identity go. Um, I have no idea, but I would say it was actually one of the strengths of such a, a, a project that it would allow these kind of ambiguities and negotiations. This is also why I very much disagreed with the way how these concepts were appropriated in Germany by the uh, people who wrote the uh, communication hand, uh, uh, guerrilla handbook because they, they made a completely one-sided uh, activist narrative out of that which completely ignored all these gray zones and therefore I think was very flat. Um, so, uh, uh, and in that sense, maybe th that is a response. I, I see that as a strength. Um, the only question is to which consequence uh, do you take it? Uh, and uh, at which point is it no longer um, uh, a basis of experiment or negotiations, but uh, when, I mean, 
literally, when when does it mean that you build up concentration camps? Yeah. Yeah. No. So I would like to answer to that in a sense that you have to see also what are the long terms of your action because for sure I would say inside New East, Luther Bliss said there was a lot of uh, uh, you know deconstruction uh, that could be interpreted also in a different uh, way. Uh, but at the same time, I would say that the long-term objective was to deconstruct power. So many of these people were against uh, power hierarchy, power domination, and so on. Instead, what the alt-right is doing uh, is to build up a new form of power. So I think it's different. And uh, well, because the, the final uh, objective is another one. No, I don't, yeah, I mean, I'd agree largely. I'm much less sympathetic to classic right currents than Florian is and you know I saw the point of the projects we were involved in as human emancipation or disalienation um, but I'll let Florian. <laughs> well, you know I would say uh, Peter Thiel also wants uh, to go up against power when he's he's creating his his island in the ocean you know um, or Bitcoin also wants to go against the power of uh, the banks and the Federal Reserve banks. You know, uh, being against power, that that's uh, maybe there. I'm more someone who's, let's say, coming from the school of thought of, of uh, Foucault. That's that's not a value. There's always power. The question is, you know, where do you put power? How do you define power? How do you how do you shape power? But I think this is really a deep discussion because then we should define what is uh, being libertarian. And for example, going back to Italy, there is really uh, a difference there because. Uh, uh, for example, if you speak about uh, uh, cyber libertarian, yeah, I, I saw. Uh, just I want to com comment and then I open. Uh, cyber libertarian, then uh, you would say uh, that is connected with uh, more the uh, US tradition of cypherpunk, for example, and also a, a specific approach on the economy. But uh, libertarian could also be interpret, uh, interpreted more related to the discourse of. Uh, uh, anarcho-socialism, uh, if you translate it then as uh, uh, in the way that is connected with the discourse of libertarianism that in Italian would be um, being libertario, that is different from being libertariano, that is uh, instead what you are saying. So I think, especially if we speak about anarchism, that is a battle against power, there are different kind of anarchists. No, I mean... And and then we should open to the public. With the um, <laughs> yeah. people I was uh, closely involved with, like London Psychogeographical Association, and I'd also say uh, some of the key people involved with Luther Blissett in Bologna, I understood us as having a debate as how to combine the best parts of um, council communism from left communism and borderism and where we were very interested in the borderist critique but saw what he positively advocated as quite authoritarian, a, a kind of super Leninism. So that was the debate I understood us to be having, um, which was quite specific uh, from a very specific political perspective. Mm -hmm. Let's open to the public. <laughs> there is one over there. Uh, fascinating discussion. It's going to take me some days to process it, um, but you open up all kinds of great cans of worms, so thank you for the conversation. Um, I wanted to bring into it the, the perspective of mass media as a weapon from its roots. Um, there's a great film by Manu Lukac uh, called Dreams Rewired, and you see a scene where the first experiments with television are the, uh, the Nazis broadcasting the Olympics from Berlin. And I didn't know that. I, was, I thought television was more US thing. But um, uh, something about the, the environment, the media environment that we're in and with the digital culture now, it is empowering even more kinds of info wars. Um, and it's hard to, to keep up with it all. But uh, this idea, Yuval Harari, for example, has a new book out that's saying these technologies are tending towards authoritarianism. And we on the left, if we're working in the arts in the left, 
uh, and trying these transgressional experiments. It's almost like we are constantly in an environment where we are needing to respond to the fact that we're already captured in an in a info war landscape. So we're only, only going to be continuously trying to catch up and respond to these power mechanisms, which I think someone like Guy Debord explains very, very clearly that we're in this society of spectacle and trying to get ourselves out of it. So um, if you could just maybe comment on this whole mass media as a weapon, uh, and, and we, that maybe we can't really reclaim that as something as a, you know, tools necessarily of a, of a healthy left uh, uh, kind of structures because they're, they're, they're like giving people AR-15s to organize society. Okay. Um, I think what we're now, uh, thanks for this question. I think what we're now seeing in practice, there has been, let's say, a strand of critical media thinking or even media utopias that um, is also very much linked to this country, even to this city. Um, it began in the 1930s with uh, Bertolt Brecht, who said, um, with his radio theory, where he said, well, you have to take this mass medium and turn it around. Uh, uh, everyone who is now a listener, a receiver, should also be a sender. Uh, that uh, theory was then updated in the early 1970s by Hans Magnus Enzensberger, uh, uh, a, um, this toolkit uh, for a new theory of the media, um, uh, where he basically already envisions the internet. He says we will we'll have uh, a con uh, congruence of the different electronic media, and in, in the end, they will enable everyone to become a producer and no longer be a consumer. Uh, that is also a text that has been taken up, for example, in the New Media Reader, which is the, let's say, anthology of new media theory uh, for particularly the American new media discourse. Well, what we clearly see is that this theory was not sufficient or that it was, let's say, naive. That, you know, by, let's say, by giving everyone the microphone or giving everyone the TV studio, uh, that this is not uh, uh, solving the issue. And let's say fascism is not just a product of you know, being one voice, having one voice and having it broadcasted uh, uh, to the masses, uh, but you can just has, have as much uh, fascism if it's the masses themselves uh, 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 who broadcast. Um, I think that, that more intelligent uh, media theories always reflected on this, but now we have the proof in the pudding. Um, uh, so that also means um, you have, I think, personally, if you ask me, you have to put some question marks be behind this whole kinds of media theory dogma that the medium is the message, that if you change the configuration of, of, of the medium, it automatically will result in other messages. We clearly see that this is not the case. Uh, you can also have, uh, you know, and even Deleuze and Guattari, who are very often pulled into this alternative discourse on alternative media visions, uh, let's say have, let's have rhizomatic organization or rhizomatic communication in, instead of, um, uh, instead of uh, top-down and centralized communication. Very clearly, they already wrote in the 1970s in the Anti-Oedipus about rhizomatic, um, uh, rhizomatic fascism. Yeah? This is very, very, it's, it's, it's very prescient, very uh, prophetic what they wrote about this. Uh, they were not so naive as those who only superficially uh, uh, read their theories. Um, so, uh, but I must say, I don't have an answer for that. You know, I, I, I can't personally not, can't, can't say, yeah, what, what do we need to do with this, this problem of media power? Uh, I think maybe it's more something for everyone here in the room to investigate themselves in, in, in their own practice. I'm, I'd just add that um, you can see some things definitely better as other in terms of online culture because for all its problems, I think Wikipedia is a very good project and I'd rather see people editing at Wikipedia than uh, reviewing what they've bought on Amazon. There was a question in the middle. Who was? Yeah, over there. Oh, I cannot see it. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for, for the acribic uh, presentation with the, all the useful comparisons. And it left me wondering a lot about like, um, the location of politics and the, ends, uh, the, the beginnings and the ends and where you would place that. Because I don't know if you would agree, but I think there is a 
kind of a contradiction that one needs to work around and that maybe you're also thinking about in, on the one hand, saying this belongs to the left spectra, this belongs to the right, there's, and then there's the gray zone. And also saying that alternative is, you know, it's just a term, so it's transgression, it's just a tool, that's not political. So there's a lot of kind of divisions going on, what counts as right and what counts as left and what counts as kind of the in-between. And maybe, you know, for me, the discussion is not really even about counterculture. It's like about culture in general and the ideological struggle within it. So I think just as well as you could hear people maybe superficially saying that, yeah, net culture has turned reactionary today, you would have it being said about culture in general. But maybe that's the political moment, saying that. And so I'm like, I'm, like, I'm wondering about this, like, if you thought about this issue and how your own presentation is political or not. Uh, obviously, you know, what, whether something is progressive or not depends on the historical moment. So, yes, uh, there are a lot of um, questions. I think you can um, it still see a left and a right, and it is worth uh, fighting a bit against the right elements. Um, and you know what? Uh, what you, I could give an example um, of things being, pro you know, something that say people involved with uh, Bordigas discourse would see uh, democracy as bourgeois, a bourgeois form, and be completely dismissive of it. Uh, but at the same time, if you go to somewhere like the City of London, where the council is elected 80% um, on business votes and only 20% uh, on the votes of the residents, um, you could say the bourgeois revolution hadn't been completed in the City of London. So in actual fact, democracy would be uh, progressive in the City of London, even if you argued from a Bordigas perspective, it wasn't progressive in most places in, in Europe. Um, so I... I I think you have to, one, be specific and two, look at the historical moment and then look at the, uh, com you know, the complete context. Uh, Florian can probably add something. Yes. Um, well, first of all, I would interpret uh, the, the political and cultural um, phenomena that we currently observe as clearly a, a counter reaction to, let's say, the dominant uh, narrative that we had since the fall of the wall, namely the end of the history. Yeah? Um, the idea, also the end of politics, in a way. Um, um, the the uh, idea uh, that we only need something like a technocratic uh, 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 governance, uh, no longer a political uh, government, um, that there is actually um, no real space for political ne negotiation because it's all uh, a matter of rationalist decision-making, huh? there is no alternative. Huh? This, that what uh, the British political science uh, scientist uh, Colin Crouch calls uh, post-democracy. We have been in, in, in a post-democratic uh, society, which is also alternatively attributed with neoliberalism, also I find this sometimes a problematic attribute anyway for, for, for about 20 years. Uh, and what we now get is the backlash uh, to this depoliticization. Actually, in Germany is a really good example of a country that still has a depoliticized government with Angela Merkel because she, she has been successful with the strat strategy of depoliticization for, for more than 10 years. Um, now, uh, 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 I think you know, uh, I'm probably you know, the, the, the evil transgressionist if I say that now, but I think there's actually one thing where um, uh, the so-called alt-right uh, and um, whoever, let's say, doesn't agree with this, this, this uh, post-politics on the left side agree, namely that, that this development uh, uh, has been detrimental and needs to be reversed and that we have a, a kind of return of uh, political and cultural controversies and debate with a vengeance. The founder of Breitbart News, Andrew Breitbart, said, famously said, politics is downstream from culture. Um, that's right-wing Gramsciism, you could say. This is actually where both sides agree. I would agree with uh, that as well, actually. Uh, um, so, uh, sorry, uh, I'm... I'm, I'm I'd, I'd also yeah. just add that, that, that kind of uh, dependence on rationality is very often in uh, the manosphere where the, the, the reduction of the arguments on this rationalist basis when he, uh, human beings are actually both rational and emotional is quite ridiculous. 
Um, and that, that kind of depend, dependence on rationality, which you can see criticized at the Franklin School before the war, even. Yeah. But yesterday in the presentation, I forgot his name, the Swedish political... Uh, uh, yes, Gardel. Yeah. Um, he pointed out, he made a really interesting observation, said you, you shouldn't focus on the right-wing extremist groups as hate groups, but you, should, you can also look at them as love groups. Yeah? In both cases, you can say, or that would be my reaction, love and hate are both strong emotions that are dialectically combined. Yeah? Um, and uh, uh, also, their, their importance uh, so as political uh, emotions has been denied for, for, for 20 years. You know, you, uh, people have been told, you know, for example, if you hate your conditions, something is wrong with you, not with society, because we live in the good society. And um, uh, uh, conversely, I would say, no, it is not uh, um, uh, just as love and hate are... are two sides of the same coin and linked to culture and politics, um, if you want to create a counter-narrative to the alt-right narrative, you also need to have a narrative of love and hate. It's not just about love, it's also about hate. Punk was a hate movement. Uh, 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 in, uh, in Rotterdam, uh, in one of the streets, we have a wall mural by, by a contemporary artist with an office worker, and underneath it says, Mary Shum uh, hates her job. You know, I think people should have uh, the right to hate their job, to hate their lives, uh, to hate conditions. If, if, you, if you put a taboo on hate, yeah, if, if you, if you uh, uh, say hate, that is uh, the extreme right, then you concede your whole territory uh, to the extreme right. This is exactly what has, uh, has happened. I would uh, leave... There is still one question, so we'll let's keep it short and uh, then you can answer. And we finish. So the founder of the Daily Stormer uh, said that they are not neo-Nazis, they are ironic Nazis. Yeah, Daily Stormer, the new magazine. Um, so I took you to be saying, okay, um, two things about this. I took you, your whole talk to be about um, that's true, A. Eh? B, that's not necessarily a good thing, and C, there's a long history of ironic Nazism um, or ironic use of Nazi symbolism. But what I took you to be saying just now, Florian, is um, in f not that it's a bad thing, it's in fact a good thing, because it's... It politicizes, and I think you've too much crunch, quite frankly. <laughs> I don't agree at all on this. But you're actually saying this is a good thing. We want to be politicized, and the ironic Nazis are helping us do it. Yes, I agree. Uh, and, but in the case of the Daily Stormer, yeah, that's Andrew Anglin, uh, the founder of the, the, the Daily Stormer, I would say this is now just a line of defense. And it's the same thing that we showed uh, in our slide uh, with Alex Jones, where he says he's a performance artist. It's basically a way how these people try to immunize themselves from, from, uh, from legal prosecution. Uh, to say it's an act, it's a performance, it's ironic. Uh, and I would even say that we see the meme culture and the meme wars as a kind of weaponization of irony. Yeah? Um, um, it is always, and, and in fact, this is something that the Ku Klux Klan already did in the 19th century. Um, the robes of the Ku Klux Klan, and we heard an impressive lecture on the Ku Klux Klan yesterday, the robes of the Ku Klux Klan, I mean, they're ridiculous, but they were intended to be ridiculous. Uh, um, also, the, 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 the names like the Grand Wizard, etc., etc., that was an ironic performance on purpose in order to, uh, to, to, to create a kind of immunity uh, for itself. You could say the, the, the whole strategy of Carnival, uh, um, the cultural theoretician um, uh, Michael Bartin has, has uh, written a whole book on this, the, the, the whole uh, strategy of Carnival is never innocent, but it's always political. Um, um, and it can be supportive in the one way or the other. Um, but no, I, I, sorry, I think I didn't answer your question. Um, uh, 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 let, let, um, Short. Yeah, the, the question was, is, is a repolitization through the alt-right a good thing? Uh, well, I think we will only know uh, in a couple of years uh, when we know how the whole story ended. Uh, uh, you could say, yes, it's a wake-up call. Uh, yeah? um, and maybe this, this can not end, end up with the, the thing is, is it, it creates a counter reaction that we don't know at the moment. It's looking way bleak. Uh, and here again, I, I agree with what has been said yesterday. Well, I wouldn't say it was a good thing. And I would also point out that that ironic defense was very much a part of the industrial culture we were addressing in the lecture. 
Ok, sì. So and then uh, um, we go on in half an hour so we can meet again uh, at, at uh, 43 uh, with the panel infiltration mapping the international far right so thank you a lot for being with us and see you later